How do fractional CMOs hit the ground running? Hi, I'm Dean Way. Welcome to the Fractional CMOs and the 90 Day Win Podcast. There's a lot of variety in how they kick off a new client engagement. In fact, there's so much variety, it's valuable to just listen to what opportunities they look for, what they tackle first, and what do they wish wasn't true when they start a new project. So um, let's find out. Uh, hi, Maria. Hi, how are you? Okay. Good, thank you. Okay, so uh, Maria, imagine that you just started a new engagement, like a year-long engagement. You're the fractional CMO. We'll talk about early wins in a moment. But first, what problems do you typically see or what problems do you normally look for on day one? And uh, tell the audience who you are and a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm Maria Bota, as you mentioned earlier. Thanks for having me on today. Welcome. I am a fractional chief marketing officer for principally startups and tech companies and a lot of people a lot of businesses in the b2b space that are wishing to pivot my background is a little unusual and then i came from the film and television production industry where i was a, a a producer and an executive producer for a while that's my first career and then i went pivoted went back to graduate school and got a master's an MBA in uh, global management. And that's how I transitioned into the marketing world. Although I had been obviously closely affiliated with marketing previously. I've worked with the top uh, media companies in the world and all the global, most of the global advertising agencies. So that's kind of my background. And that's sort of how I started uh, my career in uh, in the fractional world. Right. And the, to answer your question, um, interestingly enough, one of the first things, because of the spaces that I work in, uh, which are so often very highly niched, especially in the B2B sector, um, one of the things I'm always amazed about is like, there's nobody in the C-suite previously that's handled marketing. Right. And that's an indication to me right off the bat, like, that's okay, marketing hasn't been important. And yeah. so a lot of times, you know, founders and CEOs will suddenly almost wake up one morning and say, oh, we got to do this. And so it's a rush to see what, you know, auditing essentially what has been done and what ha and more importantly, what hasn't been addressed. And so that's where I find myself a lot of times. And, uh, you know, it's exciting at this, but at the same time, um, a little bit, you know, daunting to figure out, okay, what, what is next? But that's kind of how I usually spend my first 90 days. And that includes a lot of stakeholder interviews for me. That's really important. Audits, looking at the competitor space. Oftentimes, some of these B2B companies and startups haven't even looked at their competitive space, which is kind of amazing, you know. So also looking at what kinds of investments uh, they've made and they have the appetite to invest in. So that's kind of uh, my, you know, my my first ninety days is really looking at taking a deep dive into into what 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 has happened and what hasn't happened. I would phrase it as easily as possible. Okay, and Stacy, um, uh, hi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hello. Who are you, and what do you do, and uh, what? problems do you normally see or what problems do you try to look for uh, when you just start a new engagement? Yes. Well, yes. Thanks for having me. I'm Stacey Danheiser. Um, so I, I'll give you a little bit about uh, my background. I actually started in corporate marketing. I worked for five different Fortune 500 companies in both B2C and then switched over to B2B. And when I was, um, I decided at one point I was done with the corporate world and I left to go become a consultant uh, first, primarily focusing on value proposition, customer research, and marketing strategy. Over time, those gigs um, expanded to fractional CMO work. So, mm -hmm. you know, consulting basically has a beginning and an end to a project. Yeah. And I had several clients that were like, we need you to stay on and help oversee the implementation of this. So that's, I kind of got into fractional work that way. Um, and then that has now evolved where I have a handful of fractional clients, but then they've also asked me to stay on and train the team and help up level and upskill a team. So I have now built a, um, a mastermind program specifically aimed at helping marketers, you know, think more strategically and ideally, you know, be able to carry the torch for anything that I'm recommending within an organization that they have the background and the knowledge and the foundational skills to be able to do so. Um, 
So that's just a little bit about my background. I would say the number one problem that I see when I work, and again, I kind of approach this from a, a consulting standpoint. The one thing that fascinates me always though, having worked most of my career with non-marketing leaders and specifically in technology, where I worked with a lot of engineers and a lot of um, financial professionals. Um, and that is kind of this, what I would say is perception versus reality. Um, the, there's a perception about what marketing is, what marketing can do. And I typically find that that varies based on who I talk to on the C-suite. And the definition of marketing is completely different by person, by department. And you have this massive gap typically between what the C-suite thinks marketing should be doing and what the marketing team is actually doing. Right. So that's sort of my first problem that I'd like to solve is, is getting everybody aligned and on the same page with um, with how we approach marketing. And I typically go through an audit, audit that looks for four different things. The first is marketing mindset and skill set. Um, that's, you know, how are we thinking about marketing? What is What are the principles of marketing? And, and are we really like a customer focused organization? Or are we really doing engineering led marketing, which a lot of tech companies are? Yes. Um, I look at planning. What, what is the go to market planning process? And what steps is the team going through and what steps have been skipped. Uh, I look at execution. I've done this interesting stat, you know, 99% of marketers complain that they don't have the resources that they need to execute the plan. And my question always back to that is, well, who created the plan? Because ideally when you're creating the plan, you need to make sure that you're factoring in execution. And so I always look at the execution piece of, are they biting off more than they can chew? And then finally, I look at leadership and how marketing is, you know, do they have a seat at the table or not? And is marketing really viewed as that execution arm? And what can marketing do to start earning that spot back on the leadership team? So there's a lot of education that I, I have to do, you know, upon starting any new project. There's just a lot of um, handholding and education about what is marketing, what is not marketing, that kind of thing. Well then, okay, so let's stick with that for a second. Like, let's sort of flip it around. Um, what kind of like early wins or low hanging fruit do you try to go after? Yeah, so directly aligned with how they are perceiving marketing. Typically when I do um, stakeholder right. interviews, like Maria, Maria said, I look for like, what are the biggest things that everybody's complaining about? Um, typically quick wins and especially in, in smaller organizations, um, where the founder may be really heavily involved in marketing, they'll have an opinion about what is broken. And so I kind of just listen for, for what those things are and that we kind of tackle that part of the project first, um, just so that it is, you know, that we're starting to make progress. So sometimes that's them complaining about content production. Sometimes it's complaining about um, SEO or website or the branding. I mean, there's like a, a, a lot of things that people complain about. And I typically just, just look for what those things are. Um, I also get really involved with the sales team because I'm a big um, proponent of marketing and sales alignment. And so I look for low hanging fruit on the sales side. What is sales complaining about and how do we help close a deal now? So that it, it really sets the stage um, for other foundational things that we may want to do. And so it kind of, I guess the answer is it depends. Okay. How about you, Maria? <laughs> Early wins in the first 90 days, easy things to do. Yeah. You know, um, it depends is a big answer to that question for sure. Um, one of the things that I also like to do is really evaluate what the business goals are, you know, and, so when you talk about low hanging fruit, then to, um, you know, what was previously said, you should go for the sales side of things, right? Like how can you get closer to, um, you know, uh, closing deals and conversion rates and really show some, you know, a approach a tactic that will really address that. So it depends on the organization again. Um, and it also depends on things like you have to evaluate what are sales cycles like, you know? So for example, I've been working on it with a client that has a very long sales cycle from the time that, uh, you know, there's a prospect to the time of closing. So you have to also consider those things when you're looking at low hanging fruit, you know, and, and quick wins. Um, but for me, it's always, again, um, very aligned 
uh, to sales, you know, and conversions, you know, how do we do that? How do we, you know, push that forward? So that's how I look at, you know, low hanging fruit and, you know, what are the tactics that really uh, could lead us to that quickly? So then let's go back to something that you mentioned earlier, I think in the first question about, you know, this is the first time that uh, they've had an, someone at the C-level dealing with marketing, right? Like, what, do, what do clients normally not see or know about marketing when you start working with them? Oh, God. and you know, again, you know, education levels are very varied. For example, I work a lot with startups mm -hmm. uh, that are technologist led. Mm -hmm. And so in that space, I find they don't really know anything about marketing. Not truly. They think that, you know, strategy are tactics, for example. And right. so, you know, getting back to the point of education is really important. I would say, you know, it, it, there are there are clients, I've worked with clients that have a very high level of understanding of marketing. And they understand that strategy is the foundation of the house, right? Uh, of the marketing house. But I also, uh, because I work in the startup world a lot, um, that there's just a total lack of education on marketing. Like they don't, they know the word. Right. They have a concept, but it's not really fully fledged or fully formed. So I also spend a lot of time educating founders, you know, because that's really in the startup world who you're working with. Stacey, what do you think? What, what, do you, what, what do your clients sort of normally not see or not know about until you start working with them? Yeah. So I don't work with a lot of startups. I, I work probably with the next phase. Once they've committed a little bit more, they, they know that they need marketing. So what typically happens is they hire, I would say, seasoned sales professionals and then junior marketers. And so one of the big uh, issues is that they don't understand that marketing is more than promotion, that marketing is more than just what we're going to put on social media or more than what we put on the website. And so there's a lot of education around process that marketing actually is strategic and that we follow a process. And that really resonates, I think, with engineers, right? Because they can't believe that there's no process for marketing. It's just that they're, they've never learned it. And right. so they, they hire. And I, and I also um, listen for what their, their issues are. And they typically are complaining about you know, my marketing team's not very strategic. They're not coming to me with insights. They're not coming to me with ideas. And then I look at who they've hired and I'm like, well, of course that's the case because you've hired people who are order takers and that are waiting for direction from you. Right. And if you don't know what to tell them, then that's what you end up with. And so just having to flip that script a little bit and getting them to see that sales is a seasoned, per, you know, you can hire seasoned professionals in sales, but you can also hire seasoned professionals in marketing you know, to help accelerate the growth and accelerate um, the sophistication with, with, within the organization. Okay, then let's roll into that just a tiny bit more. All right, so um, what should a leadership team or specifically what should a CEO understand about fractional CMOs and like how to get the maximum value from somebody? Yeah, well, I think um, it's interesting. Like, I don't know if the, the answer is different than a fractional versus not a fractional, right? I think um, from my point of view, it's it, the answer is the same, regardless if you have somebody working full time or, you know, a part time uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> leader. I think um, I'm trying to think of how I want to approach this question. <laughs> You're um, <to> be nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there's just like a lot of, um, I can rephrase it for you if it's helpful. Yeah. Rephrase it. What rephrase mistakes it. do leadership teams or CEOs often make when they bring in, uh, you or a fractional team? Yeah. I mean, I, I've been really lucky and I may be selective with the clients that I, that I bring in where I am teaching them during the sales process as right. to what it looks Very like. Very important. Yes. What we're going and, and that, and part of that is because coming from consulting, where consulting is very much about the process and very much about the deliverables and the output. Yeah. Um, I want to be in control of that. And so when I'm kind of pitching any sort of fractional work, that's where I'm starting from. You know, here's the process. Here's what we're going to go through over the next six months. Here's going to be what your, the deliverables are at the end of each stage and phase of this. Of course, there's always 
nuances and changes and I get pulled in into a lot of different directions. But that I go back to that original um, engagement to say, okay, have we made these decisions? Because often what is not working, for example, content is always a big one. Let's just start creating content and fix our content and our content's not working. But the thing is, if we haven't done any customer research and we don't really understand our customer segments and we're not clear on who we're targeting, then we're not going to have good content because the number one question for content is who are we writing this for? And if you can't answer that, you know, as a C-suite and as a sales team and as a leadership team, then your content marketing manager for sure is not going to be able to answer that. And so everything kind of points back to um, the process, I guess, from, from my point of view is in, in teaching them and kind of staying methodical about going through the process. I don't want to get off topic, but back uh, when I was just starting out um, and was uh, went into consulting, the uh, managing partner there had a great phrase that he used to say. He says, managing expectations is code for lowering expectations. <laughs> Every time since what I've heard, we got to manage expectations. I hear yeah. we lower their expectations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So, hey, Maria, like what, uh, however we want to phrase it, like what should a, a CEO kind of understand? about fractional seamless to get the maximum value and or which mistakes do they typically make uh, you know, bringing so, in a fractional CMO? Right. So because of the industries that I um, tend to work in yeah. and the sectors and the maturity level of um, these companies, the most important thing is a philosophical thing. You know, it's Addressing the fact that in the C level, there needs to be a marketing voice and that needs to have an equal weight at the table. Yeah. And unless you're committed to that as an organization, as a leader, you're not going to get the maximum benefit out of a fractional or full time CMO. It's that simple. And it's understanding the importance of marketing and bringing in a fractional or full time person to fulfill that. But they have to have a voice at the table. And to All me, right. that's where um, a lot of organizations, you know, especially in the startup tech world, where they run into a, a problem where they've never thought of their organization that way. Their founders are all technical people. They're all engineers. They're all uh, yeah. from, from di very different disciplines. So when you bring in a marketing voice, it's a different discipline, you know, although I have to say I do know how to interpret engineering speak. I have become very masterful at that. And technologists speak. So it's that to me is the, the most important um, commitment that a leader in an organization needs to make is that they will give equal voice um, to marketing at the, at the C-level suite. Uh, and what about um, that uh, reminds me of a line from I think one of the oldest marketing books ever called Scientific Advertising. It's at least 100 years old. And um, Claude Hopkins. And he was sort of one of the first copywriters, first advertising people. And he has, he has this line in there where he said, um, the, the, oh, the president of that company, he was like going to be like head of marketing. He looked at me the way a general looks at a poet. Yeah. Exactly. And it took a long time to show that like marketing generates exactly. results. You know, it's not well, just like. Ooh. Because if you've spent your life speaking yeah. technology and engineering speak, and this is how your brain, because our brains do function differently. Absolutely. I mean, there's neuro. There's a neuroscience behind all of this, right? Like how our brains function differently, how marketing people think differently than engineers. I mean, it's just the way it is. But you got to give equal weight. If you want to be successful as a company, you got to give equal weight to the marketing voice, even though it may seem uh, like you said, like people may look at you like a poet. Yeah. And I've had that also. I've had that, that um, those conversations. And I won't take uh, on clients that do not commit to taking marketing seriously. Well, let's talk know? about that for a second then. Uh, like yeah. what kind of like are the signs that a client should not have hired a fractal team or isn't ready for one yet? I think everybody's ready all the time, especially at the founding moment. Mm -hmm. I think it's a huge mistake when, um, for example, technology companies... Um, don't have a C-level marketer on their team. I think that's a huge gap and it will show up very soon in your development as a business. And Stacey, what do you think? 
are there any sort of red flags that a client shouldn't have hired their fractional CMO or isn't ready for a fractional yeah. or any CMO yet? I mean, I, I would say probably the biggest one is that they're not willing to make changes. Right. Um, or, and or my favorite line of, we know exactly what our customers need. Mm. Those two are things that I listened for because, um, you know, the CEO, founder, or just anybody sort of on that, the, the C-suite has to be willing to make business changes based on what they're, what is recommended and what they're hearing from customers. Um, the other one is just being able to do customer research. Uh, and that's, that's something that's interesting. And I, I, I've done this for my whole um, career and I always find it fascinating because I do internal interviews and then I do external customer interviews. And I always, I compare the two, the feedback that we're getting from both. And there's always, you know, 99.9% .9 of the cases, there's always insights that are completely um, left out or where the organization may be blindsided by how customers think. Oh, these customers love it, love us. You're gonna have a great conversation. Then I get on the, the call with them and it's, you know, a lot of complaints and customer experience and, and, they're like, they're gonna be shocked to hear this. And usually they are shocked to hear it. And so I, I like um, being able to conduct that and to, to be able to, to share that information back because I think that's where the value is um, versus coming in and just expecting me to say yes to everything and um, and not you know provide strategic guidance. <laughs> Did you ever see that meme from, I'm sure it's fake from the engineering school. It's like a sign and it says, if it was hard to make, it should be hard to use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that's sometimes some of the work that I get to get involved in, which is refining products and offerings based on customer, you know, needs and feedback, because sometimes technologists will just make something because it's really cool. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, let's really talk about what, what is it that you're, if nobody needs it, you probably shouldn't make it. Yeah. That's the, like, just because there's a gap exactly. in the market doesn't mean there's a market in that gap, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Stacey, like, uh, uh, we'll wrap up. Here's one more hypothetical, yeah. okay? The right. CEO comes to you and says, hey, you and I are going to uh, interview and hire the next head of sales. What are you looking mm. for? Oh, I like that question. Um, so, you know, organizations that I, I've always really had – a a extreme respect for the sales organization, um, having worked for some some pretty established um, companies, sales was always the most disciplined organization and the most well run. And that's what I look for is how um, disciplined they are. And really, because it's, it's a it's a consistency game. And it's methodical. And it's about keeping track. And I think you have some sellers that are really great, maybe on the relationship side, they don't want to do any of that uh, background. I don't want to deal with the CRM. I don't want to have to <laughs> do any of that. Yeah. And so if there's this magical balance, especially as a sales leader, they're not the ones selling, right? They're not the ones in, in front of customers day to day. They're actually, the skill set is about leading the team and holding people accountable um, and making sure that they understand the, um, the strategy. And so, you know, when, when, for example, talking about things like customer segmentation, talking about things like targeting, talking about things like account-based marketing, if that's relevant for, for the industry, um, I look to see, you know, does the sales team really understand that? Does the sales leader get that? Do they, do they have um, alignment? Because that where I grew up was marketing leads and then sales drives the plan that marketing just put together. And so there's this um, magical way for, for marketing and sales to kind of integrate and to work together there. Yeah. I like, um, about the, uh, the discipline approach, especially how that depends a lot on sort of the pace that the sales leader has. Um, I, when I, I, I was in sales for a while, in fact, before I cycled out of corporate, um, I'd spent a lot of time in sales. At one point I was on this conversation uh, call cause my, um, my sales manager was complaining about something that I had put into Salesforce. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you know, tell me what screen you were on or uh, like, you know, like, where would I see that? And it turns out he had never used Salesforce or ever logged into our Salesforce. Yeah. And I like, I couldn't believe it. He might as well have told me he couldn't read. That's how <laughs> yeah. weird, right? <laughs> exactly. 
But no, there were other people who would run all the reports and stuff for him. So he had no idea what to do or even how to log in. I said, I don't think we can continue this discussion until you can at least tell me what page we're on. Why don't you go ask whoever runs your reports yeah. what page that would have been on? I'll go find it for you. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you think, Maria? What are the sort of the, uh, uh, how would you like, you know, approach hire, helping hire the new head of sales? Well, you know, it depends on the organization's needs, but um, typically I come in and there's a CRO, you know, that I partner, you know, and this is, this is typical, maybe in the technology startup sector, you know, there's always either there is a CRO, but if they need to fill that job, um, you know, it's certainly something that I am very excited to, to participate in because to me, that's my partner, yeah. you know, we work hand in hand, um, uh, and, and that's such an important thing just to have, you know, the same level of leadership, responsibility, accountability, uh, certainly, you know, things that you look at, like our track records and in industries and things like that, that are really important, especially in the startup, because, you know, you do or die by investment yeah. and you do or die by revenue. And so, in uh, most of the companies that I work with, you know, this is such a critical role that typically it's already aligned, you know, it's already um, in place. But uh, if I was asked to to uh, participate in the in the hiring process, that would be kind of like a dream to create, you know, the perfect partnership that aligns uh, with your style, your your goals and your um, and the business goals, obviously. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, this has been really great. Thanks very much for, for helping me out today. I appreciate it. Um, uh, so, Maria, why don't you tell folks how they could get in touch with you and then Stacy, you too, and then we will sign off. And I thank you again for being here. Thanks, Dean. It's been really fun to uh, participate in Stacey. It's been great hearing your insights and your wonderful ideas and feedback. Um, you can reach me. I'm Maria Bota at mariabota.com is my website. And uh, my email is maria period bota at gmail.com. There you go. Super Stacey. easy. Super easy to reach me. Yes. All right. Well, this is, oh. <laughs> I'm all over LinkedIn. <laughs> Awesome. Um, yes. Well, thanks for having me. This is a great discussion. I love hearing different perspectives. Yeah. Uh, I'm So I'm very active on LinkedIn. So I would say connect with me on LinkedIn. And then I also created a free uh, scorecard tool that I call the Confident Marketing Scorecard. Um, so you can take that and get some insights on some of the audit things that we talked about um, where you might have some strengths and or gaps in your marketing approach. Right on. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, it's been great talking to you guys and uh, everyone you. watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. All right. Bye.